My name is Simon Whistler. Welcome to Biographics. Today, the most famous, most quoted, and most accurate visionary prophet of modern times. A French doctor, pharmacist, alchemist, and practitioner of the occult, who in his lifetime would advise royalty, and who after his death would never be out of print. He is the protagonist of today's story, Michel de Nostradamus, better known as Nostradamus. Obviously, there are going to be some uh, pretty funky pronunciations in this episode. I'm doing my best. It is what it is. There is little we know with certainty about his life and exploits, but we will trace his career and look in detail at some of his most famous prophecies. And as it is fitting for such a mysterious character, there is more to be discovered about Nostradamus and his prophecies, as proven by a recent finding in the old library of his alma mater, the University of Montpellier. A chapter apparently entirely dedicated to the end of times, from which we have quoted the early quatrain, but more on that later. For the moment, let's dive into Nostradamus's formative years. Michel de Nostradamus was born in Saint-Rémy-de-Provence, southern France, either on the 14th or the 21st of December 1503, to parents Renier de Saint-Rémy and her husband Jean de Nostradamus, who worked as a grain dealer and notary. Michel's grandfather, Guy Garcinet, was a Jewish doctor and Kabbalist who had converted to Catholicism in 1455 and changed the family name to Nostradamus as a means to avoid discrimination and even persecution by the Inquisition. We don't know much about Michel's childhood except that he was very very bright and that he advanced quickly through school. Both of his grandfathers recognized his potential for learning and dedicated themselves to tutoring him. His maternal grandfather, Jean de Saint-Rémy, taught him how to speak and read in Latin, Greek, Hebrew, as well as the rudiments of mathematics. And while his paternal granddad, Guy the Kabbalist, introduced him to the more esoteric knowledge of ancient Jewish tradition and the science of astrology. Although this has been disputed, it could explain Nostradamus' interest in applying the study of celestial bodies and how they could influence human destiny. At the precocious age of 14, Nostradam signed up to the University of Avignon to study medicine. His studies were cut short the following year, however, because of an outbreak of the bubonic plague. This may have been his first encounter with the deadly disease, to which he dedicated most of his medical practice in later years. In the following four years, young Michel traveled the French countryside, researching herbal remedies and working as an apothecary. In 1522, aged 19, he gave it another go at getting a degree, this time entering the University of Montpellier, at the time regarded as one of the best for the teaching of medicine. The faculty was largely composed of Catholic priests, with whom he often clashed. Apparently, they were dismissive or even suspicious of his early astrological knowledge. Let's not forget that this was a period of great religious tension in the French kingdom, with the Protestant faction of the Huguenots growing in power both in the south and in the Parisian court, causing the Catholic establishment to be suspicious of any heretic believer, including those who had Jewish origins. But what ultimately led to his expulsion from medical school was a more mundane matter. University officials found out about his previous trade as an apothecary, something considered a lesser manual trade, and therefore unworthy of that lofty temple of medical studies that was Montpellier. This approach is consistent with views of the time. In fact, even surgeons were considered manual laborers and treated as second-class citizens by medical professionals. But was he actually expelled, though? After all, surgeons are allowed to attend lectures in Montpellier, even though they had to buy or even steal their own corpses if they wanted to practice with their scalpels. And in fact, other accounts state that Michel de Nostradamus did complete his medical degree in 1525, the same year in which he changed his last name to the Latin Nostradamus, as was common practice among intellectuals and academics of the time. But did he actually get that degree, though? Now, according to other accounts, it was during the years 1521 to 1529 that he traveled the countryside perfecting his herbal remedies and his apothecary skills. During those years, Nostradamus was aged 18 to 26, the age in which one would normally go to university. As mentioned earlier, there is little of certainty in Nostradamus's earlier life, but what matters is that he did acquire medical knowledge either through study or through hands-on practice, and that he would use that knowledge against the bane of his contemporaries, the bubonic plague. Plague.
Over the end of the 1520s and into the early 1530s, Nostradamus married and had two children. He was frequently traveling, however, especially around southern France and Italy, treating victims of the bubonic plague. There was no known treatment at the time for this infectious disease, but Nostradamus had a stab at developing a healing powder. Take one ounce of the sawdust of cypress wood, as green as you can find, six ounces of Florentine violet root, three ounces of cloves, three drams of sweet calamus, and six drams of aloes wood. So now you might be wondering, or not, did it work? Well, we know that violet root is still actually used today to treat coughs and fevers, so, well, actually, maybe yes. Although calamus, well, that's forbidden in the United States because it's so incredibly toxic, so maybe not. But what Nostradamus did get right were the methods to prevent outbreaks of the plague. Effective personal hygiene, removal of infected corpses, and fresh air. Simple stuff today, but actually pretty revolutionary in 16th century Europe. Thanks to these measures, Nostradamus became a local celebrity in the Provence region in southern France, even receiving financial support from its citizens. And in 1531, Jules César Scaliger, a leading physician of his time, became his patron and invited him to work with him in Agen, in southwestern France. But the plague did not rest. Here, in Nostradamus' own words, is a vivid description of a common sight at that time. Among the most admirable things I saw was a woman who, even while I was calling to her through the window, replied to what I was saying while so herself unaided into her own shroud, starting with the feet. She was later found dead in the middle of the house, with her sewing half finished. In 1534, Nostradamus' own wife and children died, presumably of the plague, while he was on a medical mission in Italy. In addition to being a personal tragedy, this was a blow to his own reputation of a plague doctor, which caused him to fall out of favor with both the community and his patron. In the years following the death of his family, Nostradamus started to move away from medicine and towards occult practices, most notably astrology and divination. According to legends, which unfortunately is all we have, in 1538 he was forced to leave France after a brush with the Inquisition. During his travels in Italy, he came across a young Franciscan friar named Felici, in front of whom he immediately knelt down. Years later, the friar was to become Pope Sixtus V. Nostradamus also journeyed across Greece and Turkey, picking up more occult knowledge and experiencing a psychic awakening. In 1547, he returned to Provence in the town of Salon and married a rich widow named Anne Ponsard. The two would go on to have six children together. It was around this time that Nostradamus really got into what made him famous, his predictions. He would bring upon himself a state of trance by meditating for hours in front of a bowl filled with water and herbs, or maybe in front of a mirror. The trance would bring visions, and he would interpret these into predictions. In 1550, Nostradamus wrote down for the first time these prophecies into an almanac, a popular type of book at the time, which included advice for farmers and merchants for the coming year, including astrological predictions. The success of his almanacs encouraged Nostradamus. The year 1555 saw the publication of his magnum opus, a collection of predictions divided in centuries or chapters written in the style of four-verse poems known as quatrains. These quatrains report Nostradamus's visions for the following 2,000 years and are written in a cryptic style using anagrams, metaphors, and an obscure combination of local French dialects, Greek, Latin, and Italian. Some of his predictions famously anticipated events such as the Great Fire of London, the French Revolution, the advent of Napoleon, the rise and fall of Hitler, and the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Here is what Nostradamus wrote about the fire of London. The blood of the just will be lacking in London, burnt up in the fire of 66. The ancient lady will topple from her high place. Many of the same sect will be killed. Besides clearly stating the fire of 1666 in London, the doctor also gets another detail right. The blood of the just will be lacking. Not only was the death toll of the fire relatively low with only eight deaths, but the calamity also had the positive effect of killing millions of infected rats, thus eliminating the outbreak of plague that had ravaged the city in previous years. And now let's move on to the French Revolution. Songs, chants, and demands will come down from the enslaved, held captive by the nobility in their prisons. At a later date, brainless idiots will take these as divine utterances. 
Now, this one's a little bit more open to interpretation, although you find a reference to a rebellion against nobility, a prison which could be the Bastille stormed in 1789, and the rise to power of brainless idiots, possibly the Directorate during the Terror. Napoleon also gets one, Pau ne Loren, more fire than blood. Swimming in praise, the great man hurries to the confluence. He will refuse entry to the magpies. Pampon and Durance will confine them. The first three words are an anagram of Napoleon Roy, which sort of sounds like Napoleon the King, who drew his power from military prowess, fire, rather than aristocratic origins, blood. There is also a vague reference to magpies being confined, which has been interpreted to represent Napoleon's incarcerations of Pope Pius VI and VII. Napoleon wasn't the only autocratic emperor to be mentioned in the prophecies. See what you make of this one. Beasts ferocious with hunger will cross the rivers. The greater part of the battlefield will be against Hister. Into a cage of iron will the Great One be drawn when the son of Germany obeys no law. Hister does sound a lot like Hitler, plus you've got Germany in there as well. And you even get a mention of ferocious beasts, soldiers or tanks maybe, crossing rivers in numerical superiority on a battlefield. The Great One, being Hitler again, will be prisoner in a cage of iron, which could be the bunker where he eventually committed suicide. And finally, there's Nostradamus' vision of the 9-11 attacks. In the city of God, there will be a great thunder, two brothers torn apart by chaos while the fortress endures. The great leader will succumb, the third big war will begin when the big city is burning. Two brothers torn apart, the Twin Towers, the Enduring Fortress, the Pentagon, which collapsed only partially, and a third big war on terror to begin straight after. I mean, could it be any clearer? Les Prophéties has not been out of print since its first publication, but the book that solidified Nostradamus' celebrity status was Treaty on Makeup and Jams. This is where he published the plague remedy I mentioned earlier, as well as recipes for candied orange peel and cherry preserve. But the real treat is the love jam. The ingredients for this concoction included ingredients found in every larder nowadays, including cinnamon, cloves, wine, the blood of seven male sparrows, and the tentacles of an octopus preserved in honey. All of the bare essentials. But what was this for? To quote, if a man were to have a little of it in his mouth, and while having it in his mouth kissed a woman, or a woman him, and expelled it with his saliva, putting some of it in the other's mouth, it would suddenly cause a burning of her heart to perform the love act. And just to be clear, we at Biographics do not endorse this as a method of wooing a lady. Nostradamus's fame it grew, and he attracted the attention of some VIP admirers, such as Queen Caterina de' Medici, wife to King Henri II, and real power behind the scenes of French politics. Nostradamus had hinted at some threats to her family in his almanacs, and so the queen summoned him to court, appointing him counselor and physician in ordinary to the court. In 1556, while serving in this capacity, Nostradamus clarified to her another prophecy from Centuries I, which referred to King Henri. Century I, Quatrain 35. The young lion will overcome the older one. On the field of combat, in a single battle, he will pierce his eyes through a golden cage. Two wounds made one, then he dies a cruel death. Despite being warned by Nostradamus to avoid jousting matches, three years later, King Henri then died 41 years old, facing a younger knight in a duel. His opponent's lance pierced the king's visor, shaped as a cage, and then entered his brain behind the eye. After ten agonizing days, the king died of sepsis. Nostradamus the doctor unfortunately did not possess the knowledge to treat the ailment which cursed him for much of his adult life, and that was the gout. The condition progressed into dropsy, which is an excessive retention of fluids that accumulate in body cavities, causing heart failure when it gets extreme. In late of June 1566, Nostradamus called for his lawyer to draft his last will and testament to the benefit of his wife and children. On the evening of July the 1st, he told his secretary, You will not find me alive at sunrise. This was yet another accurate prophecy. The morning after, his secretary found Nostradamus lying dead next to his bed. Nostradamus' greatest legacy is, of course, his prophetic body of work, which continues to puzzle and fascinate scholars and enthusiasts of the occult worldwide who strive to interpret his more obscure writings. We're biographics, we want to play our part too, and so we will try to find the hidden meaning behind the recently discovered quatrains which foreshadow an apocalyptic future. Here is one that we'll translate for you. In the year 19, the earth is tired. A hammer of darkness shall fall like a plague. Is this perhaps a reference to the Spanish flu epidemic of 1919? Or maybe he was writing about 2019? 
from the hands of the prints of thousand silver windows. Silver windows may refer to mirrors or screens, a thousand screens may be the internet, and who is the prince of screens who will cause this disaster by wielding the hammer of darkness? Later alone and king among the rubble, he will laugh. The prince becomes the king, sole survivor among the destruction, but who? That's him, l'homme qui siffle, which is French for the whistler. Alright, Alex, so I hope you're still watching and you're not too spooked by our little prank here. Let me reassure you that there are only 12 centuries published in the prophecies and no Qualtrains were recently discovered in Montpellier. I just wanted to make a point on how easily in recent years the internet has fostered just unsubstantiated interpretations of Nostradamus' predictions, or in some cases they've just circulated Quatrains that were completely made up. Take that famous vision of the 9-11 attacks which I read earlier, that prophecy? Total fake, made up by a Canadian website to show how easily the public can be fooled into believing such predictions. Funnily enough, it was copy and pasted across the web, and it's still today believed by many to be genuine. But the wild interpretation of Nostradamus's writing style for sensationalistic effect can be traced back to earlier years. The famous Hister Quatrain was popularized by the book The Prophecies of Nostradamus by Erica Cheatham, published in 1965, but her translation from ancient French into English is either genuinely inaccurate or manipulated on purpose. The word Hister in the 16th century referred to the Lower Danube region, not to a person. The French originally contains the word Germain, which Cheatham translates as German, but a more common meaning of the word in French was first cousin or brother. In fact, here is another translation of the same prediction by James Randi, the famous Canadian stage magician and debunker of psychics. Beasts mad with hunger will swim across rivers. Most of the army will be against the lower Danube. The great one shall be dragged in an iron cage when the child brother will observe nothing. Which may refer to any number of engagements during the Thirty Years War or the Siege of Vienna by the Ottomans or well, a whole bunch of other stuff. But as you may expect, prophesizing about World War II, well, that's just far more exciting. To conclude, we don't want you to go and doubt all of Nostradamus' work, mostly because that would just be really boring. Sure, most of his predictions, they are vague, they are obscure, they're impossible to decipher, or they're really open to exploitative interpretations. And he probably just made everything up to sell books. However, it is a fact that some of them do sort of contain accurate depictions of what was then his future. Our point is that you should always be skeptical about what you read on the internet. So I really hope you found that video interesting, a little bit of a weird one today. If you did like it, give us a thumbs up below, I'd love to know what you think in the comments section below. So hit those up and tell me how I'm doing. Also uh, watch some stuff from our archive if you want to. There's some links to all the videos on the screen and I'll see you next time.